I want to thank all those who made this evening possible. Our beloved Executive Director, Dina Gitterman, our Nevei Kodesh Board, and all the loving hands that work behind the scenes. Thank you. So we are so grateful and enormously honored to have Rabbi Edelson Talushkin visiting the Bay Kodesh this weekend. And um, I want to say, in case some of us don't know, uh, Rabbi Talushkin, I'm going to call you Joseph if that's acceptable. That's fine, Rabbi Carter. <laughs> <laughs> well, Rabbi Talushkin has this wife who is amazing. I call her um, Devorah, his wife and co-conspirator. Um, they've gifted us with this wonderful weekend. Um, and you may not know that Devora herself is an extremely talented author and playwright and inventor. And maybe later on you'll ask her what she has invented to be manufactured as we speak. Um, she worked as uh, Isaac Pacheta Singer's translator and assistant for years and, um, and wrote an amazing book, Master of Dreams, about him and about his life. But on to Joseph. I hope you feel like a second fiddle. <laughs> it's a profound privilege to introduce this very, very precious friend, Rabbi Joseph, um, cherished friend, also a luminary in the Jewish world, prolific writer, lecturer, and ethicist, who is respected, and listen to this, he's respected among all camps of Jews. That's almost an oxymoron. <laughs> Orthodox, renewal, reform, and even Haredi camps. So think about that for a moment. You may be saying, it's not possible. But it is in his case. His books on Jewish literacy, biblical literacy, the power of words to hurt and heal, the core of Jewish ethics, all and, and many great uh, historical figures like Hillel uh, and the forthcoming book about the, the latest, the late, last Lubavitcher Rebbe, uh, are found in Jewish homes and libraries throughout the world. Right-wing and left-wing halachic and humanistic, my relatives and me. <laughs> <laughs> we all have and study Joseph's books. I, how is that? So I want to discuss that for a moment. What is Rabbi Tulishkin's secret? Uh, who here has ever heard of cyber surgery? <laughs> have you heard of that, seen this? Cyber knife, cyber surgery, is a new te technology. I want to say uh, that Rabbi Telushkin has this un uncanny skill, clearly a God-given gift, to study and digest ma the massive legacy, I mean truly massive legacy of a 3,000 year tradition, our Jewish tradition, all these writings that have come down to us throughout the ages and is able to cut through to the core with laser accuracy, with both heart and mind, what really matters now? What matters now to us, to living human beings who are out in the world in the 21st century? Uh, how to live a life of justice and love and goodness? Um, Rabbi Joseph teaches uh, the ethical jewels of our, of our civilization and brings them into recognizable and usable form. So the net result is that the reader says, all kinds of readers say, yeah, that's, that, that's why I'm proud to be Jewish. That's what I want to sign on to. Uh, I want those tools. Now I have those tools to make this a reality, to make myself a better person, uh, to live and cultivate more compassion, more forgiveness, more goodness and empathy. So the focus for, on, of Judaism for many of us, and I'm also being autobiographical here, has been um, on carrying out ritual observance to the letter. And we're not carrying it out at all, and so we don't know anything. So too much, too little. And for too many of us, Judaism had, carries with it an overwhelming, kind of super ego voice, if I may, that says, you better do it right, or you're not doing it right, or you're not doing it right enough. And Rabbi Tolucian's profound gift is a refocusing of Judaism back to how we treat ourselves and how we treat others. Uh, to being fair and kind and, like I said, loving. Um, I think that that is why he is so beloved by so many varieties of Jews, uh, because he holds he holds to the Jewish tradition, the three thousand year tradition, and and all of its texts, while bringing this great this intellectual greatness in balance with 
goodness and with practice being a, a loving person. So an example, how many of you here have been uh, in synagogue on Yom Kippur and you have done the Vidui, the confession, and you've struck your chest or you haven't struck your chest, but in any event, gone through long, long lists of for the sin I did committing this, and for the sin I did committing that. Well, that has a place. That's an important. That's an important place. <clears throat> Rabbi Kalushka understands that this is only half of the story. And in one of his books, which is I think a brilliant book in his Code of Jewish Ethics, he adds a supplement. And you don't have to hit yourself for this. <laughs> for the mitzvah of, perf- of that we perform when we stop a child from teasing or humiliating another. For the mitzvah we perform when we remember to express gratitude when we were in a rush. For the mitzvah we perform when we had embarrassing information and we withheld it to preserve someone's dignity. I mean, can you imagine if our liturgy had that kind of that kind of prayer in balance, in balance? So Rabbi Telushkin's many contributions. And this is a I told him before, this is a qualitative introduction, not quantitative, because we could go on all night. Numerous award-winning Jewish treatises, a novel, TV shows, a movie, um, and co-authored with Rebbe Tzvi Devorah, an incredibly inspiring family. All of these things have been influential uh, and prove behind them a stellar individual who succeeds in speaking to a great hunger, a tremendous hunger that I feel, that I know many of us feel, a hunger for balanced and loving and humane, the core values of Judaism that some of us, and our tradition has tended to wobble a little bit. And uh, these are values that make us the people that we dream of being and, and the world that we dream of occupying. I want to end with uh, a very brief, but I think a very inspiring story that speaks so to me, and I think it will speak to you. It comes out of uh, the his forthcoming book, it's coming, and I don't actually know the title of it. The book, book that's... Ready, the Life and Teachings of Menachem and Schneerson, the most influential rabbi in modern history. Good. Thank you. So this is the lovely... I want that provocative subtitle. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's a mouthful. So this is coming um, in June 2014, and it's timed for the yard site, the 20-year anniversary of uh, the late Lubavitcher Rebbe's death. And so keep on the lookout for this. So in this very brief story, um, the chief rabbi of Israel at the time, Israel Meir Lau, had a conversation with the Lubavitcher Rebbe himself, in which he told, he was telling him, and expounding about the fact that he was so excited about his work in what he called Keruv Rechokim, which Keruv, many of us know, is bringing close those who are far away. Um, it means bringing people back to Judaism, bringing back to Judaism lost Jews who have strayed and have gone far away. The Rebbe immediately corrected Rabbi Lau, and he said, no, no, we must not label anyone as being far who are we? Put like the Pope. I think says the, the very, very oh, who am I to judge? Who are we to determine who is far and who is near? We're all close to God. We're all close to Hashem. I think that is a beautiful foundation on which to stand. There is no measure, only God is measuring. And uh, I want to thank you, Rabbi Telushkin, Joseph, our dear friend, and Dora for coming all this way and for bringing this message back to the fore, balancing, educating, and uplifting us, reminding us of the most important lessons that we hold precious. Thank you, let's welcome. I'm actually gonna ask someone to borrow, I need to borrow someone's watch. Okay, good. I know it looks like I want to start with a magic trick. <laughs> and a $20 one. <laughs> I am profoundly touched uh, by, by Tirza's introduction. Devorah and I had the great, great pleasure of living here for two years 
uh, in the mid-90s, and they were two really wonderful years. There were reasons we had to go back to New York, but we loved Boulder, and we continue to love Boulder, and the friendship we forged with uh, Tirza, with David, is part of what made this so special. There are too many people there, I'm very close to them, I'm sitting looking at Jonathan Greenwell. I, we had very incredible relationships uh, here. And after that introduction, it's going to be all downhill. No. <laughs> One of the sad things that happened to Jewish life in modernity is that the word religious came to be associated in people's minds exclusively with ritual observance. So that if two Jews are speaking about a third, a not uncommon occurrence in the Jewish community, <laughs> and the question is raised, is so-and-so religious, the answer will be given based exclusively on the person's level of ritual observance. Excuse me. He keeps kosher, he keeps Shabbat, he is religious, she doesn't, she's not. From which one could form the extraordinarily odd impression that in Judaism, ethics are an extracurricular activity. <laughs> now, I say this to the Jew who's passionately committed to ritual observance. And I'll tell you three reasons. Rituals are largely what give us the dimension of the holy. Anybody here who's ever experience the meaningful Shabbat, knows that the spiritual component of the Shabbat largely derived from the rituals associated with it. You know it from the lighting of candles, from the Kiddush, which itself means holy. These are all things that gave you that sense of sanctity. And it's very hard to transmit a tradition from generation to generation without those sorts of rituals. A second thing is rituals help guarantee Jewish continuity. Over 3,000 years ago, Jews were liberated, the ancient Hebrews, our ancient Israelite ancestors, were liberated from slavery in Egypt, an event, of course, recorded in the book of Exodus, and which Michael Wolzer, uh, the professor, of, of the political science, science professor at Princeton University, has argued that the story of the Exodus from Egypt has influenced more movements of social change than any other story of recorded literature. But if we Jews didn't perpetuate that story every year at the Seder, that story would still influence people, but we as a people would no longer be one. It's the rituals of the Seder that bring us together like that. It's the rituals of the Jewish holidays uh, that bring us together. It's the Jewish calendar. I'll give you an example. When we talk about the Jewish calendar, you know it varies every year because it's a lunar calendar. So the holidays don't always fall on the same, they fall on the same Hebrew date, but the lunar calendar is only a 354-day calendar, which leads to the odd phenomenon that in 3,000 years of Jewish history, the holidays have never once arrived on time. <laughs> Every year, the holidays are late this year, the holidays are early this year. <laughs> so imagine if a group of rabbis got together and said, you know how we can increase attendance in Shul on Yom Kippur? Let's standardize the date. From now on, Yom Kippur will be the first Sunday in October. What would happen? I think within a few years, there would be an enormous fall off in, attention, in attendance. Because part of the power of a ritual is that it forces you to conform your life to the ritual. If whenever the ritual becomes inconvenient, it can be dispensed with, you're making very explicit that the ritual has no intrinsic significance. I'll give you another example, you know, which, which ties in with this. And it actually, it's an interesting thing. How many of you know, call out if you know, when was Abraham Lincoln's birthday? February 12th. February 12th. Do you remember, have to remember the year? 1809. Right. Okay, here's a question. Okay. When's my birthday? <laughs> So here's what? Donna Zerner knows my birthday. Okay, any other psychics in here? I've known Donna Zerner probably longer than anybody in this room, including my wife, because we studied together with the Brandeis, the BCI program. And when we came here 20 years ago, this was one of the great things, reconnecting to Donna and to David now. Okay. Uh, by the way, here's an interesting fact that has nothing to do with anything else in my speech. And I'm not particularly inclined towards astrology. But does anybody else here, does anybody here know who else was born on February 12th, 1809? Charles Darwin. Oh my God. <laughs> Your birthday is February 12th, my wife's birthday is February 12th, okay. 
this have a speech only for people who are born. <laughs> okay, you see there's somebody here who knows the answer to all my questions. So, you know, there are 613 laws in the Torah. What's the 360? <laughs> if you answer that correctly, I'm sitting down. <laughs> We're the last generation of Americans who are going to know that. Certainly people under 40, let's say, are not going to know it. Why? Because some years ago, they created President's Day, the third February, the third Monday in February, which is intended to honor all presidents, but which ends up honoring none. And that's what happens when you sort of dispense with the ritual, and you make it a standardized day. And third, Jewish rituals also can convey ethics. When I was a kid growing up in Brooklyn, if you kept kosher, and I come from an observant family, you were always very careful to only buy meat from a kosher butcher. But in those days, if you went into a supermarket, you didn't have rabbinical supervision on very many products at all. And you had to check the ingredients. Today, you can go basically to a supermarket almost anywhere in the United States, and a surprising number of products will have the OU or, or some kosher supervision. A dear friend of mine told me, he said, when I was six years old, the first words I learned to read in English were pure vegetable shortening only. <laughs> he said it was not a bad thing to learn at the age of six that I couldn't have every candy bar in the candy store. So there's no question that rituals play a very significant role in Jewish life and have many wonderful lessons to convey. But at the heart of Judaism is the ethical. When a non-Jew comes to Hillel and says to Rabbi Hillel, what most people think he says to Hillel is, teach me the essence of Judaism while I'm standing on one foot. And Hillel answers, does anybody know, what does Hillel answer? That which is hated to you, who don't see your friends. What's hateful unto you, who don't do unto others. This is the Torah. Okay, but what's remarkable is, that would make sense if the non-Jew had said, teach me the essence of Judaism while I'm standing on one foot. I think almost all of us, uh, if we're in front of an audience of people from a different religion, most people there are Jewish, but let's say if you're a Christian, or well, I'm in Boulder, or you're Buddhist, you know, I mean, uh, you know, let's say you're going to always try and find the commonality in your religion and, and emphasize the humanistic aspects. It makes sense to do so. But the question the non-Jew addressed to Hillel was not a philosophic question. It was a halachic question. It was a legal question. He said, Gaineni almanat. Convert me to Judaism on condition that you can teach me all of Judaism while I'm standing on one foot. And it was in response to that question that he didn't speak about the existence of God, and he didn't speak about Shabbat, and he didn't speak about fasting on Yom Kippur. It shows how significant he saw the ethical principle as being. When I sat down some years ago, and uh, you know, starting to try and put together the book that, that Rabbi Firestone uh, spoke of, really, The Code of Jewish Ethics, so you have to have some guiding principles when you write any sort of a code. Because otherwise you can't just end up listing every single Jewish teaching on the subject in no particular order. It'll make no sense, it won't be coherent. One of my guiding principles was Judaism's insistence on the significance of free will. So I think many of you will say, so what's the big fish? What's the big insight? Everybody believes in free will. The answer is free will has a very strong religious basis, and I'll tell you why. If you believe that all that exists in the world is the physical, that there is nothing metaphysical, nothing transcendental, then the determinants of human behavior are usually assumed to be two, hereditary, heredity and environment. What else is going to determine human behavior? I remember I once saw a cartoon of a boy about nine or ten looking at his report cards filled with D's and F's, and his scowling father was looking over his shoulder and the kid is saying, what do you think it is that, heredity or environment? <laughs> <laughs> now, the argument I'm proposing that, uh, the, that without anything other than the physical, that's what we're going to be confined to, might sound at first far-fetched. By the way, far-fetched is an English word, but it actually sounds like a Yiddish word. <laughs> far-fetched, far-flung. <laughs> Probably the most famous... The, probably the most famous lawyer, but certainly the most famous criminal defense lawyer in American history was Clarence Darrow. It's not, you know, Darrow was known as being uh, not only a very famous lawyer, he was the most famous religious skeptic of his time. 
Dabrow was not only opposed to capital punishment, which is obviously not surprising, he's a criminal defense lawyer. What's less known about Darrow is, is that he opposed all punishment. And he wrote, the reason he opposed it was exactly this. He said, human beings are all the product of two things and two things only. Their heredity, for which they are not responsible, and their environment, for which they are not responsible. We all act from those motives and those motives alone. And so as a result, he thought all punishment was wrong and inappropriate. The religious dimension adds the notion of there being a soul. There is something different and unique about you, each human being, which could account for the fact that two people could come out of the same heredity, the same family, the same environment, even though there'll always be some differences in how children are raised, and one can come out a great sinner, one can come out a great saint. There is a tremendous dimension of free will. Now, I want to make it clear what I'm not saying. I am not saying that there is free will in every area of life. I learned when I was in high school that if I devoted the rest of my life, six, seven hours a day, to studying chemistry, the world of chemistry would not thereby profit. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have a talent. I'll give you another example. How many people here at some point in your life have been joggers? How many of you have been able to keep your hands up? You know, there's a reason why. How many of you have been able to run eight-minute miles? Seven-minute miles? Six-minute miles? Boy, that's the most I've ever had. In, okay, five-minute miles. <laughs> I'd say I'll tell you a funny story about that. <laughs> and it's not about me. Okay. No, there is a, uh, a man named Eric Kandel. Eric uh, Kandel, in the year 2000, won the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine. And he wrote a book about memory. And it was a scientific book, but it also was a memoir, a memoir of his childhood growing up in Austria. And he and I were once speaking together on the same program. And I was speaking, my notes were on a very sharply angled podium. And every time I put my notes down, they fell to the floor. And I'm a klutz, and I couldn't fix the podium. So Eric ran up from the audience and fixed my podium, and I started laughing. Because when I was a kid, they would say things like, you know, you don't have to be an Einstein, you don't have to be a Nobel Prize winner. Can I have to do that? <laughs> then, later in the same talk, I asked the question I just asked you. Eight minutes, seven minutes, six minutes. His hand is still up at five minutes. It turns out that in high school, he had gone to Erasmus Hall High School in Brooklyn, had been on the track team, and had run a, a mile in four minutes and 53 seconds. So I said to him, Eric, good which is the Guinness word, enough. Is your whole purpose in life to make everybody else feel inadequate? It's not enough you want a Nobel Prize, you have to run a sub five minute mile. So the truth is, free will isn't in every area of life. But this is Judaism's teaching. It exists in the moral sphere. Maimonides actually says, if you don't believe in free will, then the whole Torah becomes void. Because what is the point of the Torah? What is the point of the prophets? of telling people to act in a certain way if they don't have the free will to do so. The rabbis, in a remarkable passage in the Talmud, expand free will in a very fascinating way. It's the first Mishnah, it's my favorite teaching in the Mishnah. It's the first Mishnah in the fourth parak of Perkei Avot, of the Ethics of the Fathers. And the rabbi Ben Zoma starts it with a series of questions. The first question is, Ezehu Chacham, who is wise, and any rabbis or others, I'm asking not to answer the question, but anybody else know what, what would be the right answer? Or what would be the answer given in the Talmud? I'm open to hearing new answers. But who is wise? Ezel Chacham? The woman's uh, uh, satisfied with his portion. Okay, you gave the right answer to a different question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, there's going to be a later question in that series of questions to which your answer is correct. Ezel Chacham? One who learns from everyone. What did the rabbis do here that's really quite remarkable? Normally we'd think, who is wise? And number one, we'd think, the first prerequisite is you have to have a very high IQ. Secondly, you have to have had very extensive education. So by definition, high intelligence, wisdom, would automatically be restricted to a small percentage of the population. What the rabbis do is they say wisdom is accessible to every single person. If you're willing to learn from every other human being, you will become wise. And if you think you already know so much and aren't willing to learn from others, your wisdom will start to decrease. 
Then they asked the question, Ezehu Gibor, who is a strong one, who is a hero. Anybody know? That's not this one just yet. You're going to be the third question. Okay, who is a hero? Hakovesh Yitzro. One who overcomes his inclinations, meaning his evil inclinations. Normally, we associate heroism with great physical bravery. The problem with that, then, is this. Number one, there are many of us who aren't blessed with great physical bravery. My daughter Naomi told me that when she was four years old, she thought I was the bravest man in the world. A belief that was shattered when she was six years old and we went to an amusement park and I wouldn't go on the roller coaster. <laughs> so, so, so number one, it's not a trait that's accessible to everyone. Secondly, even if you have great physical bravery, you're very rarely called upon to exercise it. Now it's true, in those instances where you are called upon, it is extraordinarily important. But the rabbis wanted to convert this into a trait that was meaningful every day. And they said, who is a hero? One who struggles with his bad inclinations. And we all have different bad inclinations. For a person recovering from an addictive behavior, it could be alcohol, it could be drugs, that's bravery to be, and heroism. I don't say bravery, it's heroism to struggle with it every day. For one who has to struggle with issues of anger management, all of these things, I have issues I have to struggle with, I'm not telling you what they are, but um, no, but that's, that's the point. So suddenly heroism, which would be restricted to a very small percentage of the population and a very small percentage of the time, suddenly becomes accessible to everyone. And then they ask the question, Ezehu Ashir, who is rich? What's the answer? <laughs> <laughs> they say, Hasameh Bechelko, one who is happy with what he has. It's often translated as, as one who is satisfied with what he has. I have never met a Jewish person who is satisfied. <laughs> <laughs> the question, though, is, can you be happy even when you don't get everything that you want? Because otherwise you're destined to live your life in a very unhappy way. So suddenly, wealth too. You know, who is wealthy? When I was growing up as a kid in Brooklyn, a person who had a million dollars was considered very wealthy. Today, you can now make a down payment on an apartment in Manhattan, you know, with that. And I remember having an incredible experience. In the late 70s, I went to work at the Brandeis Barding Institute, and as a member of the uh, staff of the Institute, so I was invited to a meeting of the board of directors. All of the people on that board, to me, appeared to be very wealthy. But that literally was the month, the first time that Forbes magazine was publishing its list of the 400 wealthiest Americans. And all these people who seemed so wealthy to me were all reading that list, and you could tell they all felt quite poor. <laughs> and then I had another experience. Uh, I'm quite close, and I've uh, done some writing with a man who, is, who happens to be on that Forbes listing and who has well in excess of a billion dollars. And I'm sufficiently close with him that I asked him the sort of question you don't normally ask a wealthy person. I said to him, what is it like never to have to worry about money? Because to me, I would love to never have to worry about money. He said, I'm not so rich. Look at Sheldon Adelson. <laughs> <laughs> that year, Sheldon Adelson had been number three in the Forbes listing. Okay, that's part one of the story. Now part two. A few weeks later, I'm reading the New York Times, and on the front page of the business section, there's a story for Sheldon Adelson, number three is not enough. And the whole story, I mean, it was so funny, I pulled up my friend and told him that. The whole story was how Sheldon Adelson dream is to get ahead of Warren Buffett and, uh, and Bill Gates. Bill Gates and Warren Buffett. And I realized, if you're consumed with worrying about more money, you can never be wealthy, because the whole purpose of being wealthy is that you don't have to think about money. And so the rabbinic insight suddenly makes wealth accessible to everybody. When I sat down to do the code, I had been writing about issues of Judaism and ethics. And remember, I'm talking about Jewish ethics. I'm not the personification of everything I talk about. You know, I don't think I'm a bad person, but you know, these are very, very demanding standards. I don't want to pretend uh, you know, to do any sort of perfection. Uh, but in any case, so I had been writing about issues of ethics for a long time. And I didn't want to just end up repeating or just reformulating things I already said. So I decided to go back and study all these subjects again from the beginning. 
to really go back to the issues I was dealing with and see what it says in the Torah, what it says in the later books of the Bible, the prophets and the later writings, what it says in the rabbinic literature, the, uh, the, Tal the mission of the Talmud, the Midrash, uh, and then medieval Jewish thought, modern Jewish thought, modern non-Jewish thinkers, Christian thinkers, other religious groups. What did they say on it? Because I really wanted to be low and call Adam. I wanted, my primary focus was studying Jewish sources, but I wanted to be open to learning from everyone, from all sources. And I did my research the old-fashioned way that I had done from high school, with note cards. And when I get to like a couple of hundred note cards on a subject, I'd start going through them and subdividing them. So one of the subjects I was researching was forgiveness. <coughs> And when I went through the 100 or 150 note cards I had, I realized that there were three Jewish attitudes on forgiveness. There are times when forgiveness is obligatory, there are times when forgiveness is optional, and perhaps the distinctive teaching of Judaism is there are times when forgiveness is forbidden. So let me say something about the three. When is forgiveness obligatory? When a person has inflicted upon you damage that is not irrevocable, and they seem sincerely sorry and request forgiveness. You are obligated to forgive. What if you are so angry that you can't bring yourself to forgive? You have to struggle with yourself. The person who asks for forgiveness is obligated to ask up to three times. And it can't be all at once. Do you forgive me? No. Do you forgive me? No. Do you forgive me? No. No, they have to ask you three times. And you can even say to them, give me a few weeks. I got, you know, because you want it to be to be wholehearted. And, but then, if you don't forgive after three times, as the rabbis put it, Maimonides puts it, you are an achzari, you become a cruel person. Because if somebody really sincerely wants to make that peace, then you have to forgive. When then is forgiveness optional? In two instances. When somebody has inflicted upon you irrevocable damage, and when somebody doesn't ask for forgiveness, you're not obligated to forgive it. What is an example of irrevocable damage? The Talmud says somebody who libels you in public because the word spreads to others. And even if they're sorry, and even if they tell the people to whom they spoke, I was wrong, it's not true, the people to whom they spoke, they're not going to all know everybody that they told it. And so the damage is irrevocable. We can think of other forms of irrevocable physical damage. Somebody gets drunk or doesn't get drunk, drives carelessly. And somebody ends up as a result paralyzed. These are all instances where forgiveness is optional. Should one forgive? So the answer is, or if somebody doesn't ask him for forgiveness, it's also optional. In such instances, should one forgive? As I put it, the Talmudic tradition is it's optional. Yet there are reasons why I think it could be wise to do so and appropriate. And I'll give you two examples from rabbinic colleagues. Harold Kushner, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, the author of When Bad Things Happen to Good People, told me of an instance in his congregation when he was still a, uh, had a, 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 pul a pulpit rabbi of a woman whose husband had divorced her in a particularly mean-spirited and ugly way. He ran off with somebody else. He then was miserable in terms of support. Her life was terrible. And, and, and Kushner said to me he was not surprised that the woman was in rage against this man. What did worry him was 10 years later, her rage was utterly unabated. And he said to her, for 10 years, you've been walking around with a hot coal in your hand, prepared to throw it at your ex-husband, but all you've done is burn a hole in your hand. In other words, carrying around that amount of rage was harmful to her. Anybody, God forbid, had gone through the Holocaust, had the right to be angry for the rest of their lives. I grew up in the 50s, so I knew many kids whose parents were Holocaust survivors. The parents might have had the right to be angry for the rest of their lives, but it was not fun to be raised in such a household. In other words, that level of anger can be very detrimental if you can't in any way move beyond it. Another person who helped me in this regard was a man who I also have great esteem for, Avram uh, Torsky. Torsky is a Hasidic Jew. Had he stayed within the rabbinate, he would have been a Hasidic Rebbe, but he, he went to uh, medical college and he's a psychiatrist. When uh, Rabbi Torsky became a psychiatrist in the early 60s, his area was addictive behavior, which then generally referred to alcoholism. 
By the late 60s, it was increasingly referring also to drug addiction. And today, you know, the term addictive behavior refers to all forms of self-destructive types of behavior. But Tversky's medical specialty has always remained alcoholic addiction. And of course, what's the great problem for recovering alcoholics? Not taking that first drink. Because the whole problem of alcoholics is they can't control themselves. So once they take the first drink, it can set off a whole binge that can be terrible for them. So Rabbi Tversky was speaking to a recovering alcoholic who told him that he had understood finally what caused him to take that first drink. Most commonly, it's when he was in a conflict with somebody. And he had a lot of anger at another person. You all know what that means. Sometimes you wake up in the middle of the night and you can't fall back asleep because you're thinking about some hurt that somebody inflicted on you or somehow you're angry. So he said this man, for his own sanity and well-being, had to learn to control his anger. And he said to Tversky words that were so smart that they apply to every single one of us here, whether or not you have any issue with, with liquor. He said, carrying around the grudge is like allowing the person in the world whom you most dislike to live in your mind rent-free. <laughs> Why would anybody want to do that? I'll tell you another thing. How many of you, I'm just curious, by a showing of hands, how many of you say the Shema before you go to sleep at night? I think that's quite a number of people. Uh, it's something I've done. The most surprising person I ever saw once in an interview who said that he said the Shema every night was the late reporter Mike Wallace. And probably some of you didn't even know he was Jewish, but, but, but he did. But in any case, most of you, like me, many of you like me, I should make assumptions about you, might just literally say that first verse. Shema Yisrael Hashem Lokein Hashem Echad. Some people will then say the first paragraph. But the Jewish prayer book, as you might know, is not a zero-sum game. I sometimes wish the rabbis had made a ruling that whenever they added on a prayer, they had to subtract another one. <laughs> so the prayer service got longer and longer. The standard Orthodox prayer book today is published by Art Scroll. The Art Scroll prayer book, Shema Hamitah, the Shema you're supposed to say before you go to sleep at night, is eight pages. That way, by the time you finish, you're asleep. But, but they have a wonderful prayer in there that is not well known. It is clearly a Kabbalistic prayer, and I'll tell you in a minute why I'm sure it's Kabbalistic. But the prayer begins, Havei Mochel. Every night before you go to sleep, you say, I hereby forgive. And you list a whole bunch of people that you forgive who were you in this way. Forgive people who cheated you financially. By the way, what's interesting about it is you still have the right to sue them, but you forgive them. <laughs> you know, in other words, you don't have to forfeit all of your rights. Uh, but in any case, why am I sure that the prayer is Kabbalistic in origin? Because I think it's anonymous, but I might be wrong. Because it then says, all those who hurt me, bein begil gul zeh, bein begil gul acher. All those who hurt me, whether in this incarnation or in a previous incarnation. So, so that's all the good values of it. Many years ago, though, someone pointed out to me, very astutely, that even if you choose to forgive somebody who's hurt you, you should tell them that they hurt you. Because very often, we construct uh, scenarios in our head about people who hurt us, and they can get increasingly de demonic. And those people might be walking around not knowing that they hurt us. And particularly if they didn't do it intentionally, or even if they did it in a moment, let's say, of anger, they don't necessarily realize the nature and depth of the pain that they inflicted. And this person told me that when she started to speak to people who had hurt them, very often they really didn't realize how much they had hurt them. Sometimes they started crying. They didn't want to do that. And what I came to realize is, we do have the option of forgiving even if somebody didn't ask us. But let's really ask ourselves honestly if when we do so, we really have fully forgiven and really have fully been open to reconcile. Felix Frankfurt, the Supreme Court Justice, I always loved that name. I always thought that if he had a child who got married to somebody from, you know, there were Jews. What does Felix Frankfurter mean? The family came from Frankfurt. And there were Jews whose families came from Hamburg, whose last name was Hamburg. I always thought, you imagine, the Frankfurters and the Hamburgers want to invite you to the wedding to the wedding cookout. But Frankfurter had once had a very serious conflict with somebody, 
And they finally made peace. And somebody said to them, so Felix, are you willing to forgive and forget? He said, I'm willing to forgive. To forget, I can't do. But, you know, but in other words, that's why you really do want to be open and tell somebody. And then when you see that they really express sorrow over it, you really can be reconciled. Then I said there's a third category of offenses in what Judaism regards as it's forbidden to forgive. And that is you can't forgive any cruel act or certainly any extreme act committed against the person other than yourself. So you'll say to me, well, isn't that obvious? And that isn't necessarily obvious. I'll give you an example of what I mean. I'm going to speak about a man named Reverend John Miller from Mothers Vineyard. Now, why am I picking on John Miller, who nobody here probably has heard of? He had a very unusual experience. In 1997, the Secret Service comes to his church and tells him that President Clinton will be coming for services that Sunday. Obviously, the Secret Service has to check out a church, so the minister knew that the president was going to be in his congregation that Sunday. So we can assume that when he prepared his sermon, I was going to say he knew he had one shot at the president. He knew he had one, one time when he could have the president, and he really would have the president as a captive audience. There's no way the president's going to get up in the middle of a sermon and walk out. There's no way that the president's going to yawn during the sermon. You know, he knows that eyes are on him. So the Reverend Miller had this opportunity, and he decided to speak on forgiveness. An appropriate topic. In the middle of his sermon, he holds up a picture of Timothy McVeigh, the man who carried out the bombing of the federal building in Oklahoma. I know what I learned from Timothy McVeigh. I'd never heard that expression before. When he was asked if he regretted the two, two dozen children who had been murdered, he said they were collateral damage. That was the first time I ever heard that expression. Knowing that the president was there, and knowing that the president had the authority to grant, uh, you know, to vacate the death sentence, he said, I ask all of you to look at this photograph of Timothy McVeigh and to forgive him. I have forgiven him. We as Christians are asked to forgive him. I'm not saying that that's true of all Christians. I'm saying that this is what uh, the Reverend Miller said on that day. I'll give you another example of something that was said by Pope John Paul II on the first anniversary of 9-11. But before I say it, I want to say something about Pope John Paul II because I'm an extraordinary admirer of his. And there are a few reasons. One is, he did something remarkable because the church had not wanted to do it. He established diplomatic relations with Israel. He went to pray at a... So as a Jew, I have a tremendous sense. And I'll tell you why, not just as a Jew, I have such a sense of admiration. He went to pray at a synagogue in Rome, not something that a pope would do. Uh, he went to the Western Wall and prayed there. Also, in a more universal sense, he played a major role in bringing down communism. And this was an extraordinary gift. And now I'll tell you another reason. When I was a child in Brooklyn, I went to a school called the Yeshiva of Flatbush. My high school principal was David Elias, and his wife, Yafa Elias, is a woman I knew from me. Is there, by the way, are there any Flatbush graduates here? Anybody here go to Flatbush? It was a well-known school. It has a lot of graduates. It's like the Epstein Academy in St. Louis. <laughs> Uh, we're tears of Okay, so, uh, so his wife, Yaffa, wrote a book called Hasidic Tales of the Holocaust. Very often when you come across books of Hasidic Tales, they can be very moving, but you're not, you're not always sure that things occurred exactly as it tells in the story. You know, there could be a folkloristic element. Yaffa had her doctorate in history, and she was scrupulous about getting the stories right. And the story I'm going to tell you now, I also, it was corroborated for me by the people the son of the people who were involved. In the early 40s, in a town in Poland, the Nazis had already started shipping out Jews, and there was a Jewish couple there who had a two-year-old son. They knew that there was nothing much that they could do for themselves. Poland was a bad, bad place for the Jews, not only because of the Nazis, but even the Polish partisans often wouldn't even let the Jews fight with them. And and we're not good to them. But they had one hope. They had a two-year-old son, and they wanted to save this two-year-old son. And there was a Catholic couple who they were very friendly with. And they snuck out at night, risking their lives, and they reached this couple, and they brought their two-year-old son, and they asked the couple if they would be willing to raise the child. And they said to the couple, we're, we're expecting to come back after the war. If we don't, and they gave the couple two addresses in North America, 
mishpacha family they had in Montreal and in Washington. And they said, if we don't come back, please contact them. Anyway, this Polish couple were heroic because they took the child. And why did I say they were heroic? They pushed their lives in danger because everybody in their town knew that they didn't have a child. All of a sudden, a couple who were childless have a two-year-old child. So they had to run around during the war. And they were religious Catholics, so they would go to church. They would raise the boy with them. By early 1946, the parents have not come back. And it's clear they're never coming back. So they go to their local parish priest, and they said, we want to adopt this child. We want you to baptize him and have an official adoption. The priest says, tell me in the exact words what the parents said to you. And the couple were honest. And they said, well, they told us about these two families in Canada and the United States. He said, write those families. If they don't adopt the child, then we'll arrange the whole adoption here. But they have the first right. The fam both families want the child. He first, because of immigration laws, gets into Montreal. A year later, because the family in Washington was even closer, uh, he, he goes to Washington where he's raised. They always stay in contact with this Polish couple. And these are not by any means wealthy people. So the family in Washington, they're always sending money to them. Over the years, the husband dies. But they stay in close and loving contact. One day in 1978, they get a letter from the woman in which for the first time she tells them the story of how uh, uh, she had wanted to convert him and she had gone to her uh, parish priest. And she said, why am I telling you this story now? And she said, because yesterday that parish priest became Pope John Paul II. <laughs> okay, now I can say something critical. <laughs> I didn't want to say anything because my respect for him is, is, is so great. But on the first anniversary of 9-11, he said, we pray today for those who, 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 who were killed on this day, and we pray for mercy and forgiveness for those who carried out this terrible act. I don't know. Mercy and forgiveness? I mean, the only thing I think they regretted was that they didn't do it an hour later. They did it at 8.45 in the morning when a lot of people have not yet shown up to work. So I just want to say, this is the limited instance in which you can't forgive for things. The only ones who can forgive it, it are dead. So there is, you should try and do whatever you can, but you, it's not fair to ask for forgiveness. So number one, in the overwhelming majority of instances, we should forgive. There are times when forgiveness is optional, and we should uh, often, though, consider doing it, both for, the sake, uh, both for our sakes as well. And again, that point that I made, that go and ask, tell the person that they hurt you. And then the very restricted instances but not irrelevant of when you shouldn't forgive. Now we should just bear that in mind, because it's easier to repent of sins that we have committed than to repent of sins we intend to commit. You know, which was Edgar Howe, who was an American writer in the 19th century, he said, in other words, think through the consequences of your act, and think through, you might be entering into a realm where you're going to do something unforgivable. And when somebody once critiqued me on what I had said about not forgiving others, I said, maybe some of these things that these people did that were evil might not have happened if they had been taught from a very early age that there are certain acts which if you do, you can never be forgiven for by another human being. I don't know about God's mercy. Okay. A second issue I want to talk about is the issue of humility and self-esteem. Moses is the most significant uh, human being in the last four books of the Torah. Obviously, the dominant character in the Torah is God. But Moses plays a very major role in the last four books of the Torah. What were Moses' virtues? Well, some of them become apparent. He clearly had courage. You know, he, he, enters, uh, he enters history uh, as an adult when he goes and sees an Egyptian overseer beating a Hebrew slave, and he kills him. You know, the, the rabbis even discuss, should he have killed him? And there's some discussion about it. And you know what resolved the answer for me? It got resolved a month ago. How many of you have seen the movie 12 Years a Slave? There's a horrible, horrific scene there of a flogging of a black woman. And anybody who's ever questioned whether Moses should or should not have killed that overseer, just see that movie and tell me how much, how much I know, how much I would have wished that there was somebody who had killed the man who was doing it. You know, there's a level of evil. So we know Moses had guts. Moses stands up for justice. We were just talking about that with somebody here earlier today. He sees the non-Israelite 
uh, Midianite shepherds oppressing the non-Israelite Midianite shepherdesses, and he stands up for them. And it's a very, very important story, because if the only story we knew that was that Moses killed this Egyptian overseer beating an Israelite slave, we'd say he's a gutsy guy, he was a good guy, but maybe he only cared when Jews were suffering. But the fact that Moses stands up when non-Jews are oppressing other non-Jews means that he opposes all injustice. The Torah, however, never says Moses was courageous. We infer it from that incident. The Torah never says Moses stood up for justice. We infer it from that incident. There is only one virtue the Torah attributes to Moses. What is it? Humility. Humility. Now this man Moses was very humble. But humility is an interesting issue because it's hard to know sometimes where we are motivated by humility when, let's say, we refuse to take a position. Uh, we're offered. The synagogue says, join our board or something else. And we, or, or, or a leadership, become president or something. Uh, a leadership. And the Rabbi Torsky I spoke of earlier has a great way of knowing whether what's motivating your refusal is humility or low self-esteem. And he said, how do you know which it is? He says, humility inspires you to do more. Low self-esteem demoralizes you. It's a good you know, thing to say to do, right? But I want to say something then also about the importance of self-esteem. The most famous law of all of the Torah is, love your neighbor as yourself. The explicit command is, love your neighbor. What's the implicit command? Love yourself. Think about it. Are you more apt to be kind to others when you're feeling good about yourself or when you're feeling bad about yourself? When we were kids and we got in big trouble and we had to tell our parents, were we more happy, to, were we more likely to do it when our parents seemed to be in a good mood and feeling good about themselves or when they were already in a bad sort of mood? In other words, it's important to feel good about yourself because it's usually better for the people around you as well. I mean, that's the moral dimension of it not just the psychological dimension. Wonderful story they tell about a rabbi known as the Chafetz Chaim. In Jewish life, people sometimes became known by the title of their book. His name was Israel Meir Kagan, but his first book was called Chafetz Chaim, and it was about the laws of not speaking ill or unfairly of others. He lived during the last stage in human history when it was possible to be very widely known without being recognized. He lived from 1838 to 1933. And we know that photography already existed in the mid-1800s. We've all seen photographs from the Civil War. But it was much less common in Eastern Europe, and it was even less common among religious Jews who questioned whether it was appropriate to take photographs of human beings. So the Chafetz Chaim had written his book, I think it was around 1870, and it was very well known. And he was going around lecturing about it, but people didn't recognize him until he was introduced at the speech. So he's on a train going to a town to give a speech, and he sees a man sitting opposite him who also appears to be a religious Jew. They start talking, and he asks the man, where are you going? He said, well, I'm going into town to hear the Chafetz Chaim speak. He's the greatest tzaddik, the greatest saint, and the greatest Talmud Chacham, and the greatest scholar in the Jewish world today. Chafetz Chaim was a little embarrassed hearing himself described with such superlatives. So he said, you know, I happen to know the Chafetz Chaim. He's not such a tzaddik, and he's really not such a big scholar. The other man gets so angry that he slaps him in the face. <laughs> the train pulls into the town. That night, the man goes to his speech, and he sees to his utter horror that the rabbi who slapped is now the one giving the speech. So he goes over to him and says, Rabbi, I had no idea it was you. Please forgive me. The Chafas Chaim says, I have nothing to forgive you for. It was my honor you were defending. <laughs> he said, I actually owe you a debt of, of, debt of, of, uh, of thanks. He said, you taught me an important lesson. I've been going around telling people how bad it is to speak badly of others. You taught me, don't go around speaking badly of yourself either. And this is a very, very important issue. So we want humility to derive also from a good sense of self-esteem. I had occasion recently to do a five-minute YouTube on this subject of, of a crusade I have 
probably an inappropriate term for this crap I'm doing, <laughs> of a campaign I'd like to see for parents to reserve the highest praise of their children for when their children do kind acts. Children in the United States, and this is true probably in many countries, get their highest praise usually for their academic achievements, their athletic achievements, their cultural attainments, and in the case of girls, for their looks. Kids need all the thanks that they can get, all the compliments that they can get. All I'm asking is, is that the highest compliments be reserved for acts of goodness. Because people can be very bright, and people can be very cultured, and people can still be very terrible. What would happen if children got their highest compliments for their acts of goodness? We'd raise a generation of people who most liked themselves when they were doing good. And that's why this idea could have a transformative effect on society. I'm going to talk quickly. I want to talk about a couple of other ideas about the difficulty of change. What do you think is, what makes it difficult for human beings to change a pattern of behavior? I'm, I'm opening it up to comments. I'm brief, don't give full disquisitions, but yes? You're unwilling to change. Okay, people might be unwilling to change, but why would they be unwilling to change? They're satisfied with the way they are. Okay, so they might be unwilling to change because they think what they're doing is right. That's why, I'll take it in a minute, that's why terrorists are particularly not susceptible to changing and becoming good people, because at the very moment that they're doing the most evil thing that can be done, they're also convinced it's the right thing. So that's wrong. Somebody called that, yes? Inertia. Inertia, which I think is probably a very, very big factor, because it's very hard to affect the change, yeah? All the way in the back. Fear of loss. Fear of? Loss. Fear of loss. Okay, could you expand on that a drop? Losing what's known or what's familiar or something that's dear to us. Okay, some behavior might not be good for us, but we're just so used to it, so we almost don't want to lose it. That you know defines who we are. Yes. There were some other hands. Yes. A lack of confidence. A lack of confidence. You're afraid you might not succeed, so maybe don't even try. Is that what you mean? Okay, that's excellent. Yes. We get swept up in old habits. We don't even know we're doing it. We so get swept up in old habits that we don't even know we're doing it. Right. It's like, I remember years ago, you know, they, this is not exactly the same thing, but I remember they did a study that showed that one of the negative, it so happens the campaign to get fewer people to smoke has been probably the most, one of the most effective campaigns in my lifetime, because I remember how common smoking was when I was younger. But I remember there was a certain category of people who got so nervous when they read about those studies that it caused them to smoke more. <laughs> But no, but you're right, that we, we are so swept up, we don't even know what we're doing, and that we're doing it. I want to offer a few other insights coming out of the uh, biblical tradition. The Bible notes the difficulty of change in the very opening chapters of Genesis. For whatever the reason, I don't want to get into all the philosophical implications of it, Adam is given this one command, not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Okay, we all pretty much probably know the story. The snake, who mysteriously enough has four legs and talks, <laughs> says to Eve, convinces Eve to eat of the uh, fruit. By the way, people always say the apple, but we have no way of knowing what the fruit was. It doesn't say that in the Bible. And she then gets Adam to eat of it. And Adam said, and God says to Adam in anger, why did you do this? And what did Adam say? Eve told me to do it. God says to Eve, why did you do it? The snake told me to do it. In other words, one of the most common things that makes it hard for people to change is the refusal to accept responsibility and to blame others. There was a one a young woman I knew in her teens who was constantly getting into trouble and always blaming others. And I said to her one day, I am particularly pessimistic about your future. You are the most unlucky person I know. You hang out with such a crowd that you're constantly influenced by them. I said, ironically, if you ever took responsibility for the bad things you had done, I would be extremely optimistic about you, because if you caused the problem, you could uncause the problem. But if it was always somebody else's fault, then you're not, you know, then then your future is dire. Another problem is rationalizing. Reb Tirza mentioned in her talk, you know, the al -Khais. So one of the al we uh, we confess to is, and we also say baonis. Either we did it purposely or we did it under duress. Onus means duress. 
And of course, the question is raised, Ernst C. Mohn, who is a, a, a lifetime associate of uh, Martin Buber. So C. Mohn said, but if we did it under Duris, what's the sin? And he said, we said we did it under Duris. We said we couldn't control our temper. But we could have. We said we were under a terrible financial pressure. But we could have. You know, we could have done it. You know where you see an example of someone rationalizing? That's in the Torah. And one of the great features of the Torah is it doesn't, it presents our great figures with their flaws. There's a famous story in the Torah where Moses goes up to Mount Sinai and stays there so long that the Israelites are convinced he's not coming back. So they decide that they need some conduit to God, and that conduit, of course, will be a golden calf. And who do they get to build the golden calf? Aaron, Moses' brother. Moses comes down from Sinai, furious at Aaron. What did these people do to you that you did such a thing? Listen to Aaron's response. I said to the Israelites, Who has gold? Hit Parku. Take it off. And they gave it to me. Give it to me. And I threw it into this fire. I threw it into this fire and out came this golden calf. <laughs> The dog ate my homework, you know. <laughs> Another way of rationalizing evil is doing something wrong and then saying you made a mistake. I remember there was a terrible case a number of years ago where a young couple, they were young, I acknowledge that, in New Hampshire, uh, the girl had become pregnant, but obviously her pregnancy didn't show very much, and they didn't know what to do, and the baby was born and they suffocated the baby. And at their trial, they said this was a terrible mistake. But that wasn't a mistake. A mistake would have been had they tried to save the baby's life and accidentally done something that caused the baby's death. They intended to kill the baby. I'm not, I'm not going to get into the whole other moral issues involved, but it's very important. As long as somebody does something wrong and causes a mistake, that's not enough. That's certainly not enough to motivate them to, to, to make changes. So this is just a few examples. I'll give you one last one because it's the most obnoxious one. Though it's hard not to do if you've been caught doing something wrong, pointing to worse things done by others. Why do I say it's obnoxious? Because, can you imagine if every time we did something of which we were proud and we told people, you know, I'm really proud, look what I did, and the response was, look, that guy did something much greater than what you did. You know, we would feel we were being deprived of a legitimate sort of uh, compliment. And uh, so that's not a very good thing. I want to just raise one other issue and then open it up for some uh, comments and discussion. How many people here wish they had better control over their tempers? Okay. A lot. But now I'm going to get an even more honest answer. How many people here are seated next to someone who they wish had better control? <laughs> I want to offer a guideline, I'm going to say a few more things about it, but I want to offer a guideline, and then I'm going to tell you a story which happened during the time that Deborah and I lived in Boulder. So it's a very precious story. But one thing I want to say, if you follow this one rule that I'm now going to say, you will never again, during a moment of anger, say something that will cause an irrevocable break in a relationship or terrible hurt. And that is not an uncommon phenomenon. How many people in your families at the level of first cousin and closer have relatives who are not on speaking terms. I'd say easily a third of the people. Now these are all people who grew up, you know, loving each other. Sometimes it can be brothers and sisters. Every year before Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, when I speak uh, in LA, to, I'm out there for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, uh, I ask people if they're open to reconciling with a brother or a sister. And, and I always make the point, I said, I'm a parent, I have four children. There are a few things that I could think of that would cause me more pain than if I thought that someday two of my children were not on speaking terms. And I say, if you take the fifth commandment to honor your father and mother at all seriously, unless it's some, such extreme behavior, very rare sorts of behavior, you should find a way to reconcile. 
you know, it can, and again, I know that there are people here who, who have suffered such terrible hurts, maybe it can't be done, but there are instances, I think, where it can. And sometimes it came about because people said terrible things to each other. And by the way, in families, it's very easy to hurt another person. There's nothing really a stranger can say that's going to really hurt me, unless that person talks about my being overweight. No. But there's nothing that, that can really hurt me. You can scare me, God forbid, a mother. But people who know you well can really hurt you because they know you intimately. And that can use the law as that information to hurt. So this is what I'm going to say. Restrict the expression of your anger to the incident that provoked it. No matter how angry you get at another person, never start speaking about things that happened five years ago or eight years ago because you will then speak in such an unbalanced and unfair way that you will say things that the other person will not be able to ever really fully overcome that hurt. They'll always think that's what you're always thinking about. And there's another very unfortunate tendency in human beings. It's not, a tr it's not fair, but it's unfortunate. People have a tendency to believe that what people say when they're angry is what they really feel. Now the truth is, what people say when they're angry is what they really feel at that moment. But it doesn't mean that that's what they permanently feel. When our children were very small, and one of them started crying in the middle of the night at 2 in the morning, and I had to be the one in that time, let's say in that instance, who had to go up and give them the bottle, I wasn't thinking the whole time I was walking, I am so pleased to be a father and only get two hours sleep tonight. You know, I mean, you know, at any given moment, I don't want to know every comment my children have ever made about me. I don't want, to, I don't want them to know every comment they've ever made about them. When people are angry, they often say things that they mean at the moment they say it. But that's not the entirety of what they mean. But the person who hears it, it's hard not to think that that's what they really feel. And then to be worried when they're not talking like that, well, now they're acting nice. So that's why it's very important. It's been pointed out to me, though, it's very important for people who do have explosive tempers and who do say those things, they also have to be aware of what, are the, of what their triggers are. That's why it's very important for people to do enough self-analysis or analysis with others to realize this is the sort of thing that triggers me. That's the most important time to force yourself, to force yourself to observe that rule of restricting the expression of your anger to the incident that provoked it. And you know what? If we work on ourselves hard enough, we can do it. We all can do it. Can you imagine, God forbid, if you're mugged and you feel your life is being threatened? There's nobody in the world that you more hate than that mugger. And yet when he or she more likely a he, ask for your wallet. Do you start cursing the person? Or you act very politely. Here's my wallet, here's my credit card. You know, are you going to be very polite because the stakes are so great? So it's when we tell ourselves that we can't control our temper, we're deluding ourselves. I'll give you a, a test that, will, that it can prove I'm right, uh, or that I think will suggest that I'm right. <laughs> Everybody here who said that they would like to exert greater control over their tempers, if you knew that if you reduced your expressions of anger by 75% over the next six months, you would receive $2 million, how many of you think you'd be able to reduce your expressions of anger? What's tragic is, is that in the absence of a financial incentive, people are capable of destroying relationships that are worth far more than $2 million. So what I'm saying is, if we do have issues, and if we know we have triggers, we really have to start to work on knowing what those triggers are. The people with us have to know what those triggers are too. And, you know, when you come to know somebody intimately, it could be an espousal relationship, a child relationship, you have to know what those areas of great sensitivity are to the other person and to anticipate them. Because usually it's the person who's getting angry has some reason to be angry. I'm not saying they're getting angry over nothing. Their response is excessive. But if you know them intimately enough, you have to also be excessively careful not to provoke those sorts of responses. I'll just tell you one more story and then I'll finish. The, the story that I said had to do when we were in Boulder. At the time, we came out with two, uh, three of our children. And when we first came, they were very young. I mean, they were very young throughout. They were five, three, and one. A year later, uh, I was giving a speech. I had just brought out uh, the book, Words That Hurt, Words That Heal. And I was speaking in, uh, in Denver at the JCC. 
And Naomi, who was then six, and Shira, who was four, uh, said that they wanted to come to my speech. They were six and four. They were like all, like all Jewish parents. I had brilliant kids. But uh, <laughs> you know, I thought they were not exactly ready for it. Uh, by the way, they're wonderful kids. I'm complimenting them yeah. for all their good. But in any case, so I tried to discourage them. And I said, I don't think you're going to find it so interesting. Hey, Daddy, we know you travel and give speeches. We want to hear you. Okay, so they come with me to Denver. And there was a big crowd there. It's like similar to tonight. I'm a very proud father. I introduce Naomi. I introduce Shira. Everybody applauds. And they sit down in the front row. Ten minutes into the speech, I asked the audience, how many of you grew up in a household where somebody's bad temper had a bad effect on you? <laughs> Among other hands, two hands in the front row. <laughs> if you're laughing as hard as you're laughing, you can imagine how people laughed when the kids were in the air, sort of not knowing why there was such laughter going on. I was embarrassed. Finally, I gave the only answer I could. Unfortunately, my wife was a bad temper. <laughs> It turned out that year that Naomi was in first grade, and her reading was not coming along as swiftly as it could. And so I started working with her on her English reading, and my wife says that I am very patient the first time I explain something to somebody, and very patient the second time, and I get snappy the third time. So I've been snapping at Naomi. So after the speech, I said to her, I said, Naomi, first of all, I want to apologize, because you're not getting the answers wrong to be bad. You haven't understood it yet. So for me to get angry is wrong. And if I do that in the future, I want you to say to me, Daddy, you're not supposed to do that. Which he started to say. It was very irritating. <laughs> <laughs> but I learned an important lesson. Parents have to learn how to apologize to children. How many of you grew up in a household where your parents didn't apologize to you? It's a terrible thing. Because the lesson that it conveys is you only have to apologize when you're weak. All parents make their children apologize when they've done bad things, and they're right to do so. A child who never learns to say, I'm sorry, will grow up to be an obnoxious human being. But if when the parent has been in the wrong, they don't apologize, the real lesson they're teaching the child is, you only have to apologize when you can be forced to apologize. You only have to apologize when you're weaker than the one demanding the apology. What a statement it is when a parent can say, I'm sorry. It also makes the child realize that if the parent tries to convey any religious, spiritual message, they're serious about it. Because they realize that there's a God also. And that they recognize that they've done something wrong. Anyway, so we just examined you know, a number of perspectives. The issues on forgiveness, the different dimensions of forgiveness, the significance of self-esteem, and the fact of how to distinguish when what's motivating us is humility, and what's motivating us is, uh, is, uh, is, a, is a low self-image, a lack of self-esteem. The issue of difficulties and change and controlling anger. There's a wonderful line of uh, Rav Nachman of Bratzlaw, who died just over 200 years ago. Rav Nachman used to say, if you're not going to be a better person tomorrow than you were today, what need do you have for tomorrow? I once concluded a speech like that, and somebody said, Joseph, that is a real downer. <laughs> so let me rephrase for announcement. I wish all of you a good today and an even better tomorrow. Thank you. Uh, what it means is, is that you're open 
in most instances, I, I'll tell you an example of an instance where I wasn't, where I was open to forgiving, but not to reestablishing a relationship. Uh, but as a general rule, it means that you are willing to let go of the incident that caused you to be angry at the other person and try and reestablish a connection with them and not make reference to that incident anymore. This is, by the way, very important, obviously, in spousal relationships. There has to be a time limit on how long one person can mention another, because if a person mentions things that happened 10 years ago, and 12 years ago, and 13 years ago, it leaves the feeling that it's, you know, being held there. So, you know, that's one. But I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with you, there was one person who really tried to reconcile with me, and I told him I forgave him, which I could, uh, but it was a psychiatrist who I'd gone to who I learned to gossip about me. This was, and had mixed in with the, uh, it mixed in with the truth of other things. I did take revenge. I wrote a murder mystery about a gossiping psychiatrist. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, uh, no, but you know, so that person actually came to me, tried a few times, I finally said to him, listen, I'm willing to forgive you, it's not something, I'm not holding a grievance against you at this time, but I'm not open to becoming friends with you again. You know, I mean, it was uh, too gross a violation. And I can't, you know, fully, and I have reasons to believe that the guy was not so wonderful in other ways, but, but as a general rule, that's an extreme instance. As a general rule, it is an openness to reestablishing a connection with another person. And I think it's very important. Oh, okay. Yes, Reverend Parsons. Well, segue to Andrea's question. Um, there is a woman named Eva Kor, who is a Holocaust survivor. Some of you may have heard of her. Uh, she was one of the Mengele twins. She suffered horrendous damage. And she has begun a campaign in the world to forgive the Nazis. And um, she has been the, you know, the recipient of huge animosity from Jews worldwide. But she takes people to Auschwitz and she promotes an idea that we need to start letting go of our, our grievance and to move on. And I wonder what you think of that sort of forgiveness. She's on a campaign to forgive. Okay, I think it's appropriate for her to forgive for herself if she wants to forgive. Was her twin killed? Uh, she, eventually, she died early. I don't, but died as a result of what Mengele had done to her. I don't, it doesn't seem to me that she has the right to forgive on her twin's behalf. It doesn't seem to me that she has the right to say, I forgive you for what was done to my twin. I don't know, it, it means if you do that, if, you know, every once in a while you hear of parents who are forgiving their child's murderer. I can forgive somebody who steals my property. My child is not my property. I don't have the right to forgive. You can say, I'm urging all Jews who went through the Holocaust can forgive for themselves. I think Jews have been remarkably open to reestablishing relations with Germans, but I don't know what it means the actual Nazis. Who does she, what exactly, how are we, what does she mean? We're forgiving. She would look into the face of Mengele if she be, and say to him, why? I need to move. She, what she says is, I need to move on. I want to let go of this. Okay, so it's a different level of forgiveness. It's not that I'm saying, I'm willing to be, you're somebody I'd like to establish a friendship with. No, no, she's willing. No, okay, that's what I said. I said, I knew as a child growing up that friends of mine who had parents who had gone through the Holocaust and who remained in a state of perpetual rage, this was not a good thing. You know, I, then data started coming out about it, the children of survivors, but I knew it because I went to a camp that had children of survivors. So, okay, that's a, but I don't know if it's a worth, I don't know why it's, of the various things going on in the world today, I don't know why it's an important campaign. What are the implications for the Jewish people? The, the question really is, is it our obligation to continue <coughs> our lack of forgiveness for the German, for the, for the Nazis? Not the German people, but for the Nazis. I don't know. I don't feel inclined to forgive Torquemada. I'm not obsessed about the Spanish Inquisition. I, I, I don't know. Okay, so maybe there are some people who can't move beyond it. I, I think we can. I think I'm very open to Germans and others. I don't hold that. I don't hold a grudge against all Germans. When I, when I was a kid, I probably did, because I assumed most Germans had been supportive of what was done, or certainly didn't try in any way to stop it. Uh, I think it would be inappropriate if the children of those people, who are manifesting different behavior, 
I don't know. I look, I, I, you know, I suppose there's more to be said, but that's my gut reaction. Uh, yes, all the way in the back. I have a feeling you disagree with me. So wait, so do you want to maybe say more no, about I'm it? I'm thinking about the adage in Israel that's taught to the children, the lowest go off, the lowest law. Don't forget and don't forget. And that's, I mean, that is promoted in the society. I wonder what you think about that. Is it worthwhile having an adage, don't forget and don't forgive? I think what the Nazis did was of such an extreme dimension that I, I don't know what it means to forgive them. I mean, you know, all that I, all that I have to, I am overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly opposed in, in most instances to capital punishment. I have, I'm probably a minority in this group who thinks that there are times when it could be appropriate. Every time I'm tempted to say, I think capital punishment is always wrong, some horrendous murder gets committed, such a torturous, I mean, even this terrible case now, where they messed up the whole execution process, it is terrible, but if you read what the guy had done, that he buried a woman alive, you know, I'm just simply saying, so what does it mean to forgive? Maybe I, I'm totally opposed to torturing the person, but I don't know what it means to forgive. The very book, he said he goes past the Holocaust by just moving the Jews forward. He said he put a big emphasis on our future. You know, he just tried to uh, keep the Holocaust. He did. Okay, no, you reminded me of something else. The Lubavitcher Rebbe, I don't know what he would have said in that instance. My tendency is that he wouldn't have said to forgive. But I do have a story that I record in the book in which the Rebbe did advocate uh, trying to maintain a relationship with somebody who I would claim was beyond forgiveness. I'll tell you what it was. It was a guy named Lazar Kaganovich. Does anybody know who Lazar Kaganovich is? He was a Jew who murdered more people than any other Jew in history. He was a Stalinist officer. Right. No, well beyond that. He was in Stalin's cabinet. He was the only Jew that Stalin maintained a close relationship to. He was utterly ruthless. He helped carry out the murder of the Kulaks under Stalin's orders. He built the subway in Russia. Moscow was named, actually, for him, the Kaganovich subway. He worked people to death. If he heard people complaining about him, he had them executed. He was, I would say, probably about the most evil Jew that I could ever imagine. There's a reason why I'm telling you all this. Stalin then arrested his brother and told him, he said, we have informants who say that your brother is working with the Nazis, and when the, this was uh, during the war, and when the Nazis take over Russia, Moscow, they're going to install him as their puppet. The likelihood that the Nazis would install a Kaganovich as their puppet. So Kaganovich says to him, do what you have to do. And then later on brags that he got a gun smuggled to his brother so that his brother could commit suicide. And when his wife said to him, how do you allow, you know, you stay with Stalin, he's doing anti-Semitic things. She said, he said, don't. So when, when the brother's wife wrote to him, he said, you, you're both sons of the same Moshev you know, Moshe, he, and so he writes back to, uh, to the sister-in-law, and he says, don't come to me with your appeals of blood. My father is Joseph Stalin. You know, so here's a very evil guy. Okay, that's part one of the story. Now part two. And uh, Israel Singer, who's the head of the World Jewish Congress, is visiting Russia, and he comes back in the, uh, in the 80s, late 80s, and he meets with the Rebbe, and the Rebbe asks him, what did you find out in Russia? What did you do? One of the things he told the Rebbe, you didn't there on a Yom Tov, and on the last day of Yom Tov, when, when you say Yisker, there was a larger attendance in Shul than there usually is, and the Rebbe discussed with him, maybe we should start saying Yisker in Russia every Shabbat, you know, he discusses other things, and then the Rebbe, and then he tells the Rebbe, I met with uh, Lazar Kaganovich. So the Rebbe was shocked that Kaganovich was still alive. He ended up living till the age of 98. Uh, and the Rebbe said, has he done Shuva? And uh, Singer said, I don't think so. Didn't ever speak about it. The Rebbe said, go back to Russia and still try and get him to do chew. So I put that story in. There were two odd people that the Rebbe tried to get to do chew. The other one was the chess player, Bobby Fischer. <laughs> Bobby Fischer was Jewish according to Jewish law. I don't know how many of you know, in his later life, he became a very vicious anti a bit really vicious anti Semite. You know, a Mein Kampf sort of anti-Semite. But in an earlier period, he had tried to get Samuel Roshevsky, who was a who was considered the greatest Jewish plus chess player, 
prior to Bobby Fischer, who was an observant Jew, to speak to Fischer and try and influence him. It didn't succeed. Fischer wrote an angry letter to the Encyclopedia Judaica asking his, that his name be removed, the entry of Adam be removed. But the Rebbe did try and get these people to do tshuva. That they didn't say something about them, that the Rebbe wanted them to say something about him. Okay, yes. They're living in your mind rent yeah, free. One that I heard was that when you when you hold a grudge, it's like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. <laughs> you know what? I have heard that. I forgot it. It is brilliant. I want to repeat it in case people didn't hear it. Holding a grudge is like swallowing poison and hoping that the other person dies. <laughs> right. No, that level of anger. So it's a fine line between what, what Tirz is saying, you know, about this campaign and others. But okay, yes. It's not hard to get on to a more positive. <laughs> Because if otherwise you said, you know, it's a good thing to ask for forgiveness, but there's no specified time, so it becomes very hard to do. But because it's a social norm among Jews who take the high holiday seriously, people are more open to air requesting forgiveness, and people are more open to granting it. And that's why we want to look to all these opportunities, how religion can really act as an enlarging force in our life. We're all very aware of terrible things that have been done in the name of religion. And it often can be used to try and discredit religion. By the way, it's not only religion. Terrible things were done also in the name of atheism. Communism and, and Nazism were both atheist movements. So I don't want to just pin the blame on one or the other. But you know what? What I've really concluded over the years, religion will make a person better when they want the person, when the person wants to be made better. I, you know, if you do a law with the sense of it, you're doing Shabbat, and you want as a result to become a special sort of person, it's going to really help you and impel you. You take Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur seriously, it won't. You know, they tell a story about a rabbi, there were two men in this community who were having a horrible feud. And so finally, the rabbi comes up to them before Kol Nidre, he says, it's ridiculous, you're going to go into synagogue asking God to be forgiving to you, and... And you're being so unwilling to be forgiving to each other, so the two men reconcile, make peace, shul ends. And one says, they meet after shul, one says to the other, I just wish for you everything you wished for me. And the other one says, it's starting up already? And I said, but the truth is, we know that when Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur come, that we are going to be more open. We do. I have a friend who's a rabbi in L.A., David Wasnika. You know, there's a big tradition in Judaism that during the 10 days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, you should really try and act very nicely. And David said, you know, on the one hand, it seems naive. So what do we think? If we're not nice the whole year, and suddenly we're nice for those 10 days, God will forget and forgive us? He said, no, that's not the lesson it's intended to teach. The lesson it's intended to teach is we want to realize how good we can be. If you say to somebody, I want you to change this behavior and for the rest of your life never violate it, the person is going to give up in advance. But if we learn that for 10 days we can speak fairly about others, 
For 10 days, we can restrain our anger. For 10 days, we can be scrupulously honest. For 10 days, we can be exceedingly generous. It's going to have an impact. It doesn't mean that we're going to live exactly like that all the time, but we need to be reminded of how good we can be. I remember years ago, I read a book called... I read a book, and I've forgotten what the name is. It dealt with excellence in business. And one of the things they discovered was, at that time, IBM was at its peak. Uh, and IBM had the uh, highest percentage of its sales force that achieved their quotas. What do you think the secret was? Low quotas. They set low quotas. <laughs> and as a result of setting low quotas, people felt good about themselves, and as a result, were motivated them to go in to do even more. If you set high quotas, you defeat people in advance. If you tell people, you have to change this, baby, you have to change this, you have to change that, and if you ever violate it, then that's it. If you ever say something like that again, that's it. If you ever do that, you know, that's it. So the person, you think that you're motivating the person to try and do it, but what the other person is feeling is, I'm not going to be able to do it. And the goal of motivating change is to make the people really feel that they, that they can do it. And that's wonderful. That's why I'm saying it's so good. And that's why ordaining a holiday around it makes it easy for people to do it. Yes? You said that the expression of anger is something momentary. But what about what the Talmud says? Right. Okay, I said, no. What I wanted to say was, when people say, and then I'm going to explain what you said, who this is referring to a famous punning comment in the Talmud, and a very important one. Uh, what I'm saying is, is that what people often say, people will often make exaggerated statements when they're very angry. I will tell you the truth. Have I uh, have ever violated that rule I came up with? Restrict the expression of your anger to the incident that provoked it? And the answer is yes. I don't think I've done it in recent years. But I want to say, every single time I violated it, I regretted it. There's not a single time. Because anything I said could have been, if I wanted to justify it on the grounds that I wanted to affect better behavior, I didn't have to say it at the moment of greatest anger. When I can't be fair, the other person can't hear it. Uh, what you're referring to is a famous statement in the Talmud that you can judge people by how they act in three ways. And it's all a pun. One is kiso, which refers to a pocket. So in other words, you can assess a person's character by their generosity. Bikoso, how a person acts when they drink. And uh, bikaso, how a person acts when they're angry. So I'm taking it for granted that people will get angry. The question that distinguishes, some people are of milder temperament than others, but the question that distinguishes character is how you act when you get angry. And also, can we recognize that we, if we act excessively when we get angry, we have to realize we can inflict very, very terrible hurts. And there's a fourth view of the Talmud. Do you remember what the fourth one is? Kiso, kaso, kaso, and then the one that doesn't work with the pun is v'yesh omer sachaka. How does a, what does a person do for entertainment when they play and other things? That's actually, uh, that's actually also in the Talmud. But thank you, it's an important, it's an important teaching in the Gemara. Okay, I'll take, I think you're our last one. Okay, um, so I struggle with the label of evil because I think it gives us permission to not forgive easily. And so I wonder what you think about that. I mean, I know, I'm not saying... Is there any act that you can say was evil? Was putting people in gas chambers evil? Yes, but I want to look, if you look at the individuals who did what they did rather than the group as a whole, then you might look at the individual under duress or other situations differently than you would as if you look at the group as a whole. I just think that... But if nothing can be called evil, then I wonder if anything can be called good. Is all good always the same? I mean... Uh, no, I just think it's an easy out, and I, I think it's used too easily, and I, it worries me. Okay, I agree with you. you it's used to... Oh, Yes, she's saying that she is uncomfortable with the usage of the term evil because it's the label, labeling an act, an act or a person uh, as evil. You know, it's a very tricky issue that you're actually raising because I'm also tempted very often to say, well, it's not the person, but it's the act. So I'm denouncing the act, and it's not the person. But then I realized, if we want to be more logical about it, 
What does that mean? Let's say somebody does many great good deeds. Should I say, well, he's not really a good person, but those deeds are good deeds. If good deeds don't define a person as being good, then evil deeds don't define a person as being evil. But then, is there no such thing as a good person? So again, if we're careful in how we use, you're right. If the term is used too quickly, listen, I know, uh, I know a mother who makes her, calls her child a bad boy for doing things that are not bad. And it drives me absolutely crazy. You're a bad boy. I mean, you know, we all, and it's terrible. You know, it really is terrible. Evil sort of in a category unto itself, and people should be very cautious before they use the term. Certainly cautious before they use it in any non, uh, in a non, uh, in a setting that doesn't involve uh, terrible cruelty against another person. But I think there are times when it's when it's appropriate. Leave me something better. On which to add. No, no, it's not your fault. That was not an evil question. That was. Very nice quote. If you can spoil him, Tamishet to help the Kakel Tamishet. You stand up and say the whole quote. I have a feeling you know Rav Nachman's speech. I know it, but you know Rav Nachman better than me. Im tamin she tuchal the kalkel. If you believe that you can spoil tamin she tuchal takain, believe that you can also fix up. Now that's great. You know what? I'm going to tell a story about an evil act for which it's the most moving repentance I ever heard. So let me end with that. Okay. In 1922, there was a Jewish member of the cabinet in uh, in the Weimar Republic. His name was Walter Rathenau. Just out of curiosity, how many people have ever heard of Walter Rathenau? Einstein used to quote Rathenau. Einstein said, Rathenau says to him, when a Jew says he goes hunting for amusement, he's lying. You know, because, <laughs> and Heine, you know, Heine said that by and large Jews were not hunters. Heine said, because when we see hunting going on, who do we identify with? Usually the animal. But anyway, okay, this is a very unusual story. But, I, but it's an important story. Rathenau uh, engineered a bit of an economic recovery in Germany right after World War I. And the German economy was in terrible shape, and there was this absurd inflation. And then in 1922, he's assassinated by three sort of forerunners of the Nazis. Maybe it was a little later than 22, but it was in the 20s. Uh, two of them are killed by the police and the third one is caught. And they really were like pro, pro, you know, pro, pro, prototypes of what the Nazis were. Rathenau's mother makes a remarkable statement. She writes a letter to the mother of the murderer. And she says to him, if your son would stand up before the court of law and acknowledge that what he had done was wrong and accept whatever punishment was meted out to him, I could forgive him for the pain he's caused me. I don't know what happened at that point, but the man goes to prison. He gets released years later. The Nazis consider him a hero. Later on, during World War II, he helped 700 Jews escape from Marseille. There was an article written about it in Harper's Magazine in 1943 called My Favorite Assassin. He said he went to prison, he had a hatred of all Jews. He was convinced that Jews were responsible for the economic horrors going on in Germany. He said he was aware of the fact that Rathenau's mother had written that letter to his mother, and it caused him to start reading Rathenau's writings and speeches. He never felt fully innocent of what he had done because he became convinced that if Rathenau lived, he might have become the chancellor of Germany. How did this whole story become known? Because one of the people that he saved was a nephew of Rathenau. And when he saw this, because he accepted payment for the people who were trying to accept for, escape from Marseille, but he, would, but he would help people escape for free if they had no money. And he came across a man named Rathenau. And he said, were you related? And he said, that was my uncle. And it was to him that he confessed. And that became the basis of the article that appeared in Harper's in 43. It was to him that he confessed that he's never been able to overcome his sense of great guilt, that this might have been the person who might have been elected. So 
that is probably the most moving story of repentance I've ever heard for an act that, as I said, is normally regarded as beyond the possibility of repentance. Not exactly a happy story on which to end, but it's better. <laughs> 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 <laughs>